Te jo vari madam ya ta vini mayo ya cha tri sargo mesha. Te jo vari madam ya ta vini mayo ya tra tri sargo mesha. Dam na swina sada nirasta kuha kam satyam param ti. Dam na swina sada nirasta kuha kam satyam param ti mahi. Oh my Lord, Shri Krishna, son of Vasudeva. Oh my Lord, Shri Krishna, son of Vasudeva. A all-pervading personality of God. I offer my respectful obeisances unto you. I offer my respectful obeisances unto you. I meditate upon Lord Shri Krishna because He is the absolute truth. I meditate upon Lord Shri Krishna because He is the absolute truth. And the primeval cause of all causes. And the primeval cause of all causes. Of the creation, sustenance, and destruction of the manifested universes. The creation, sustenance, and destruction of the manifested universes. He is directly and indirectly conscious of all manifestations. He is directly and indirectly conscious of all manifestations. And he is independent because there is no other cause beyond him. And he is independent. Because there is no other cause beyond him. It is he only who first imparted the Vedic knowledge unto the heart of Brahmaji. It is he only who first imparted the Vedic knowledge into the heart of Brahmaji. The original living being. The original living being. By him, even the great sages and demigods are placed into illusion. By him, even the great sages and demigods are placed into. Illusion. As one is bewildered by the illusory representations. As one is bewildered by the illusory representations. Of water seen in fire or land seen on water. Of the water seen in fire or land seen on water. Only because of him do the material universes. Only because of him do the material universes. Temporarily manifested by the reaction to the three modes of nature. Tem Temporarily manifested by the reaction of three modes of appear nature. factual, although they are unreal. I appear factual, although they are. Unreal. I therefore meditate upon Him, Lord Shri Krishna. I therefore meditate upon Him, Lord Shri Krishna, who is eternally existent in the transcendental abode. Who is eternally existent in the transcendental abode, which is forever free from the illusory representations of the material world. Which is forever free from the illusory representations. Of the I meditate world. upon Him, for He is the absolute truth. I meditate upon Him, for He is the absolute. Dharma Projita Kaitavotra. Dharma Projita Kaitavotra. Paramo Nirmatsaranam Satam. Paramo Nirmatsaranam Satam. Vedyam Vastava Matra Vastu. Vedyam Vastava Matra Vastu. Shivadam Tapa Trayon Mulanam. Shivadam Tapo Trayonanam. Shimad Bhagavate Mahamuni Krite. Shimad Bhagavate Mahamuni Krite. Kimba Parer Ishwaraha. Kimba Parer Ishwaraha. Sadyo Ridi Avarudyate Tra. Sadyo Ridi Avarudyate Tra. Krite Bihi Sususa Bistakshana. Krite Bihi Sususa Bistakshana. Completely rejecting all religious activities which are materially motivated. Completely rejecting all religious activities which are materially motivated. This Bhagavad Gita Purana propounds the highest truth. This Bhagavad Gita Purana propounds the highest truth, which is understandable by those devotees who are fully pure in heart. Which is understandable by those devotees who are fully pure in heart. The highest truth is reality distinguished from illusion for the welfare of all. The highest truth is reality distinguished from illusion for the welfare of all. Such truth uproots the threefold miseries. Such truth uproots the threefold miseries. This beautiful Bhagavatam compiled by the great sage Vyasadeva in his maturity. This beautiful Bhagavatam compiled by the great sage by his maturity. Is sufficient in itself for God realization. Is sufficient in itself for God realization. What is the need of any other scripture? What is the need of any other scripture? As soon as one attentively and submissively hears the message of Bhagavatam. As soon as one attentively and submissively hears the message. By this culture of knowledge, by this culture of knowledge, the Supreme Lord is established within his heart. The Supreme Lord is established within his heart. Nigama kalpataror galitam falam. Nigama kalpataror galitam falam. Sukamukad amrita dravya samyutam. Sukamukad amrita dravya samyutam. Pibata bhagavatam rasam alayam. Pibata bhagavatam rasam alayam. Muhur aho rasika bhuvi bhavakaha. Muhur aho rasika bhuvi bhavakaha. O expert and thoughtful men, relish shimad bhagavatam. O expert and thoughtful the mature fruit of the desire tree of Vedic literatures. The mature fruit of the desire tree of Vedic literatures. It emanated from the lips of Sri Sukadev Goswami. It emanated from the lips of Sri Sukadev Goswami. Therefore, this fruit has become even more tasteful. Therefore, this fruit has become even more tasteful. Although its nectarine juice was already relishable for all. Although its nectarine juice was already relishable for all, including liberated souls. Including liberated souls. Shinvatam Swak. Sambhatam Swakata Krishna Sambhatam Swakata Krishna Punya Shravana Kirtana Punya Shravana Kirtana Hidyan Taksto Hi Bhadrani Hidyan Taksto Hi Bhadrani Vidu Noti Srihit Satam Vidu Noti Srihit Satam to hear about Krishna from Vedic literatures, to hear about Krishna from Vedic literatures, or to hear from him directly through the Bhagavad Gita, or to hear from it directly through the Bhagavad Gita, is itself righteous activity. 
He himself provides the sacrifice. And for one who hears about Krishna. And for one who hears about Krishna. Lord Krishna, who is dwelling in everyone's heart. Lord Krishna is dwelling within everyone's heart. Acts as a best wishing friend. Acts as the best wishing and friend. And purifies the devotee who constantly engages in hearing of him. And purifies the devotee who constantly engages in hearing of him. Nasta praesu bhadre su. Nasta praesu bhadre su. Nityam bhagavata sevaya. Nityam bhagavata sevaya. Bhagavati uttama sloke. Bhagavati uttama sloke. Bhakti bhavati naistiki. Bhakti bhavati naistiki. In this way, a devotee naturally develops his dormant transcendental knowledge. In this way, the devotee naturally develops his dormant transcendental knowledge. As he hears more about Krishna from the devotee, from the Bhagavatam. As he hears more about Krishna from the Bhagavatam. And from the devotees. And from the devotees. He becomes fixed in the devotional service of the Lord. He becomes fixed in devotional service of the Lord. Tadarajas tamo bhava. Tadarajas tamo bhava. Kamalo bhadayas chaye. Kamalo bhadayas chaye. Cheta itar anavidam. Cheta itar anavidam. Stitvam sattve prasiddhati. Stitvam sattve prasiddhati. By development of devotional service. By development of devotional service. One becomes freed from the modes of passion and ignorance. One becomes freed from the modes of passion and ignorance. And thus material lusts and avarice are diminished. And thus material lusts and avarice are diminished. Evam prasanna manaso. Evam prasanna manaso. Bhagavad bhakti yoga taha. Bhagavad bhakti yoga taha. Bhagavad tattva vijyanam. Bhagavad tattva vijyanam. Mukta sangha se jayate. Mukta sangha se jayate. When these impurities are wiped away. When these impurities are wiped away. The candidate remains steady in his position of pure goodness. The candidate remains steady in his position of pure goodness. Becomes enlivened by devotional service. Becomes enlivened by devotional service. And understands the science of God perfectly. And understands the science of God perfectly. Vidyate hridaya grantis. Vidyate hridaya grantis. Chidyante sarvasam saya. Chidyante sarvasam saya. Siyante jasya karmani. Siyante jasya karmani. Drusta evat manishwari. Drusta evat manishwari. Thus, bhakti yoga severs the hard knot of material affection. Thus, the bhakti yoga severs the hard knot of material affection. And enables one to come at once to the stage of a samsayam samagram. And enables one to come at once to the stage of a samsayam samagram. Understanding of the supreme absolute truth, personality of Godhead. Understanding the supreme absolute truth, personality of Godhead. Therefore, only by hearing from Krishna or from his devotee. Therefore, only by hearing from or from his devotees. In Krishna consciousness. In Krishna consciousness. Can one understand the science of Krishna? Can one understand the science of Krishna? Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 1. Chapter 18, verse number 20. No, wait a minute. It's 19, 19, yeah. Sorry. Kuta punargrinato namatasya. Kuta punargrinato namatasya. Mahatta mai kanta parayanasya. Mahatta mai kanta parayanasya. Yonanta. Yonanta Shakti Bhagavan Ananto. Yonanta Shakti Bhagavan Ananto. Mahat Gunat Vat Yamananta Ahu. Mahat Gunat Vat Yamananta Ahu. Translation by Srila Prabhupada. And what to speak of those who are under the direction of the great devotees, chanting the holy name of the unlimited? who has unlimited potency, the personality of Godhead, unlimited in potency and transcendental by attributes is called the Ananta, unlimited. Purport by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada. The Dvija Bandhu, or the less intelligent, uncultured men born of higher castes, put forward many arguments against the lower caste men becoming brahmanas in this life. They argue that births in a family of sudras, or less than sudras, is made possible by one's previous sinful acts, and that one, therefore, has to complete the terms of disadvantages due to lower birth. 
And to answer these false logicians, Srimad Bhagavatam asserts that one who chants the holy name of the Lord under the direction of a pure devotee can at once get free from the disadvantages due to a lower caste birth. A pure devotee of the Lord does not commit any offense while chanting the holy name of the Lord. There are 10 different offenses in the chanting of the holy name of the Lord. To chant the holy name under the direction of a pure devotee is offenseless chanting. Offenseless chanting of the holy name of the Lord is transcendental. And therefore, such chanting can at once purify one from the effects of all kinds of previous sins. This offenseless chanting indicates that one has fully understood the transcendental nature of the holy name and has thus surrendered unto the Lord. Transcendentally, the holy name of the Lord and the Lord himself are identical, being absolute. The holy name of the Lord is as powerful as the Lord. The Lord is all-powerful personality. Or the Lord is the all-powerful personality of Godhead. And he has innumerable names, which are all non-different from him. And are equally powerful also. In the last word of the Bhagavad Gita, the Lord asserts that one who surrenders fully unto him is protected from all sins by the grace of the Lord. Since his name is and he himself are identical. The holy name of the Lord can protect the devotee from all effects of sins. The chanting of the holy name of the Lord can undoubtedly deliver one from the disadvantages of a lower caste birth. The Lord's unlimited power is extended on and on by the unlimited expansion of the devotees and incarnations. And thus, every devotee of the Lord and incarnations also can be equally surcharged with the potency of the Lord. Since the devotee is surcharged with the potency of the Lord, even fractionally, the disqualification due to lower birth cannot stand in the way. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. So this is a wonderful purport that explains many of the glories of chanting Hare Krishna, the absolute, uh, which has the absolute power, uh, the same power that Krishna possesses. We, therefore, by chanting even once the holy name of the Lord, uh, sincerely, without any material motive, the only motive is to please the Lord, one can be freed of all sins committed for many, many lifetimes. That's how powerful the holy name is. We don't realize that. We think it's just like any other mantra, something you just say and, and uh, it's supposed to be good. Or, or well, Most people don't really understand the meanings of the mantra. It's just like... Uh, on the Quintus Codicy, the pundit chanted many mantras. Do you know what they all mean? <laughs> Actually, they're very nice. Uh, they are traditional, ancient mantras glorifying Lord Vishnu. But you didn't understand any word. I don't understand any word, right? So what effect does that have? Well, you could say, well, it's the same as chanting Hare Krishna. I don't understand Sanskrit. So there is some effect, definitely. Uh, but it depends on who's chanting. Just like uh, uh, Prabhupada gives the example of the uh, uh, lips of a, or the, the tongue of a snake. The tongue of a snake is, can be poisonous uh, in the sense that uh, uh, Milk touched by the lips of the snake can become poisonous. Of course, the snake has to inject the poison with its fangs. But still, there is some poison even in the in the lips and the and the and the tongue and the, and I guess any any uh, 
uh, juices in the mouth of the snake. But uh, the same thing is true about impure people chanting Hare Krishna. To hear a pure person chant Hare Krishna like Prabhupada is extremely potent, the same potency as Krishna. Uh, but to hear the same mantra chanted by an impure person is uh, doesn't have exactly the same potency. It's not because the mantra doesn't have the potency. It's because the person uh, is contaminating it with their material desires. So uh, you can't contaminate the holy name, but the, the vibration of the name uh, can become contaminated by that person. So it's not the same to hear an impure person and a, and a pure person. So therefore the mantra should be received by a bona fide Vaishnava. That's the whole point. Uh, however, even an impure person who chants Hare Krishna, uh, there is some benefit, but it's not the same as hearing it from a pure person or pure Vaishnava. Uh, so, therefore, we need to contact a genuine devotee and in Iskand, that is Srila Prabhupada and his sincere followers in order to receive the mantra correctly and, and properly. So, uh, Prabhupada speaks now about the Dvija Bandhus. These are sons of higher class people. They can be Brahmanas, Chachas, and Vaishas. Usually it's, it's, it's Brahmanas, but the, the other higher classes also. And they're unqualified. They, they never really learn from their parents who were qualified how to fo follow the rules and regulations of spiritual life. So, but such people put forward many arguments against lower caste men who they say cannot become Brahmanas because they were not born in a Brahmana family. They argue that birth in a family of sudras is, or less than sudras, is made possible by, by one's previous sinful acts and that one therefore has to complete the terms of disadvantages due to lower birth. Now what's wrong with that statement? Who would like to say what's wrong with that statement? Let me read it again. They argue, these are the low class, uh, non-qualified sons of Brahmanas. They put forward arguments against the lower caste men becoming Brahmanas in this life. They argue that birth in a family of sudras or less than sudras is made possible by one's previous sinful acts and that one therefore has to complete the terms of disadvantages due to lower, lower birth. What's wrong with that statement? You're obviously casting people based on the birth. And rejecting oh, wait a minute, you have to speak in the microphone, sorry. <laughs> So they're casting people into certain privileges of life based on the birth, which itself is not, there is no bona fide reference to that. As the Lord says, it's only based on guna karma vibhagasya. So that's one. And the second thing is that it also um, denies the mercy of the Lord and the devotees uh, which can be, you know, distributed to anybody, and and by the pure uh, potency of the Lord's message, they can be purified. So, it denies that, and yeah, but the, it it says they argue that birth in a family of sudras or less than sudras is made possible by one's previous sinful acts and that one therefore has to complete the terms of disadvantages due to lower birth. So uh, both things you said are not incorrect, but here it talks about birth in a family of sudras or less than sudras is made possible by one's previous acts. Well, wait a minute. Yes, you have to come forward. Sorry. Mm -hmm. 
What you said is correct, right? But there's some other point here. Yes. So that I wanted to say that. Uh, like speak closer to the microphone. We can't hear you. You walked all the way over here to speak into the microphone. Sure. So uh, come closer, closer. Yeah. Yeah. Srila Rupa Goswami, he states that uh, if a person uh, who understands the science of Krishna and who's engaged in service Krishna, uh, he is actually, his position is higher than that of anyone born in a Brahmana family. So I do not uh, think that this statement is right. So the color or the caste, uh, the place of birth, uh, it does not uh, uh, determine uh, if uh, somebody is uh, qualified as a brahmana, as stated in the Nectar of Devotion. That's a correct statement. Uh, however, there's another little point here. It says, they argue that birth in a family of sudras or less than sudras is made possible by one's previous sinful acts, and that one therefore has to complete the terms of disadvantages due to lower birth. Yes. Okay, that, that, that last part of the argument, <laughs> It's not true. It's a, speak closer to the microphone. Yeah. The first part of the statement, yeah, that, that's, that's correct. Logically, one takes birth according to his previous karma. But the last part of that is not, that has to complete the, what's it called, to complete the? And therefore has to complete the terms of disadvantages due to lower birth. So that's not true because, you know, uh, everyone is born, was low born. Um, well, this means that they have to suffer. For yeah, their sins. exactly. Don't say yeah. yeah. But they, they, still, they can't get the mercy of the Lord. It's not that they have to complete the cycle. Even in that very life, they can actually be elevated to uh, a high platform, you know, by the mercy of the Lord or by taking shelter of the Lord. So that the last part is not, is not absolute. That is correct. But there's still one little point. <laughs> yes? I'll just try one more. Is that because even if we use the logic of the So this is uh, essentially, this principle is based on the karma. Yeah. So they're using the principle of karma saying that because you're born, based on that you have to suffer the disadvantages of that birth in order to burn the karma that you were put into. Yes. But doesn't the karma principle itself talk about um, the fact that one is you are born with certain karma, but you also create karma or you can burn the karma? Well, that, yes, that, you, that, you, you can create more karma while you're, yeah. or, or you while you're burning burn something. Also. Burning means you have to suffer it. Right, but but, the, the, in, by su but even in suffering, you can commit more sins. Yeah, but this the, doesn't accept a karma then, which is what I think we're talking about, uh, isn't it? <laughs> okay, one more thing. I think uh, what you said is not wrong, right? But <laughs> yeah. there's, there's still some point. I here. think the idea is that you condemn, you know, to live your your life due to your. Uh, with the, uh, the proud sinful, sinful activity you commit. So basically, you cannot change it in one sense, they say. So you have to live, you have to live. That's correct. Okay, the point is, they're assuming that people born in the higher classes have no karma. You see, it says here that They argue that birth in a family of sudras mm -hmm. or less than sudras is made possible by one's previous sinful acts. Right. Well, wait a minute. How about birth in a family of vaishas? They, they, they didn't commit any sins in the previous life? Uh, Maharaj, the way I understand, they, they mean the karma according to the sinful activities, but they also good karma also. Yeah, but both good and bad karma are bad. But they're assuming that these, these higher, higher classes never committed sins in their previous life. They, they're attributing s karmic sinful reactions only to the sudras and lower. And they're implying that they did not commit any sins in their previous life. That's why they took higher birth. Is that true? No, it's not no, true. Different, no. 
they also committed some sins. That's why they took birth. <laughs> and, and even if they didn't commit any sins, but they performed uh, what you call mixed devotional service. So it was not pure devotional service. That's why they took birth again. So so in other words, they're, they're assuming that only sudras are sinful, and we are not sinful at all. But even if, even if they didn't commit any sins, the fact that they took birth means that they performed their devotional service with some material motive. Therefore, exactly. they still have to purify it. So, in, in other words, the, the fact that they think like that, yes. they have no true knowledge. Exactly right. And it's, it's pride. Yeah. They, they have no true knowledge. This is probably the reference to what you said in previous, in Kaliuga, person who was born. Yeah, just speaking in oh. a microphone. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where you found the reference. <laughs> In so Kali Yuga, they were, uh, was it well, in Bhagavatam? Was it Bhagavatam? no, it's in the fourth canto of Bhagavatam. I can tell oh, you exactly so there's a reference to that one? And that's, and that's referring, in that fourth canto of Bhagavatam verse is referring to the Varaha Purana. Hmm. Yeah, because I think uh, the fact that they are born, even if they are born into a higher family in this Kali Yuga doesn't... Well, that mm. verse said, let me, let me read it exactly right, exactly what it is. Pride is a demonic. Hmm. Yes. So they're acting as demons. Is it four twenty one forty? Yes. One second, let me just double check this. Four twenty one forty, exactly right. Brahmanas take birth as demons in Kali Yuga. That's well, this is more to that, but that's just the gist of it that there are brahmanas that take birth as demons in Kali Yuga. That means they can be born in a brahmana family, but they're actually acting like demons. They're proud. Yeah. So, so therefore they make these, these like Dvija Bandhus. Although they're born in a brahmana family, they're actually like Dvija Bandhus. They're uncultured men born of higher caste. And they put forward many arguments against the lower caste becoming Lower, lower caste men becoming brahmanas in this life. You see, they say it's not possible that, that brahmanas in this life. That's also an important statement. They're, they're saying there's no hope for them in this lifetime. They have to wait to take birth in a brahmana family in the next life. But they themselves have taken birth in brahmana families, but because they are dvija bandhus, they're not qualified. They're and they're acting like demons, making up false philosophies and speculating. Yes. And Krishna said in Bhagavad Gita, pride is demonic, right? Yeah, uh, Nirmama Moha Jita Sangha Dosa. Yes, so the uh, 15th chapter, 5th verse. I, I, I forgot how to start the verse. Those who. No, no, no. Nirmama Moha Jita Sangha Dosa, the Atman Jita Vinivita Kama. That Dhamba also. The, the, Dhamma, that's, that's in the Dhamma 16th chapter. Yeah. Like you. Yes. So it says, uh, the surrendering process is described here very nicely. The first qualification is that one should not be deluded by pride because the conditioned soul is puffed up, thinking himself the lord of material nature. It is very difficult for him to surrender unto the supreme personality of Godhead. So, and then in the 16th chapter, verse number eight, well, verse number four is the one you quoted. Yeah, yeah. Pride, dumbo, darpo, bimanas cha, kroda, ha, paryusam, eva cha. Pride, arrogance, conceit, anger, harshness, and ignorance, these qualities belong to those of demoniac nature, right? And also in the eighth verse of the 16th chapter, it says, It says, Asatyam apratistam ham te jagadakur anishwaram. They say this world is unreal with no foundation, no God in control. They say it's produced a sex desire and has no cause other than lust. So these are the uh, complete demons. <laughs> but again, it's based on this false pride. Okay. So that's one point. Uh, but yet, there's another point, and that is, what are these 
what are these Drijabandhus doing? They're speculating, right? And uh, Prabhupada explains this by quoting a verse from the uh, Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu where it says, Asatyam kalu na ye bhava na tam starkinu uh, yojayat. And this verse says, anything transcendental to material nature is inconceivable and thus cannot be grasped through mundane arguments. So, it is inconceivable that someone born in a very low family, even lower than Sudra, who was trained in being a demon, can become purified in this lifetime. It's inconceivable, but yet it's a fact. Why? Well, I'll give you an example. One time, some devotee, devotees came out to Prabhupada, and Prabhupada had invited these brahmanas in Vrindavan to do the opening ceremony of the Krishna Balaram temple. And some of the devotees said to him that, uh, Srila Prabhupada, you know, uh, sometimes we take prasadam and hand it out in Vrindavan, but the uh, brahmanas always refuse prasadam from us. And Prabhupada said, oh, he says, why is that? He said, because they say that we're, we're not really uh, brahmanas, so therefore whatever we offer to the Lord is contaminated. <laughs> so what did Prabhupada say? He said, but we offer with the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. So is the mantra contaminated? The mantra, uh, as long as you chant it sincerely, is non-different than Krishna. So what is more powerful, the mantra or the, uh, the, the Hare Krishna mantra or the, uh, in, in that with, with which the devotee offers to Krishna and humbly, sincerely asks him to accept the offering? He said, therefore, that offering becomes... Uh, the prashad of Krishna. So what is more powerful? Uh, the prashad or the brahmanas, uh, you know, speculation, right? So you see, this concept of pride amongst the Kali Yuga brahmanas, uh, 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 or for anyone, that doesn't matter, it could even be a devotee, it, it is a very dangerous thing, and, it's, and, and then it leads to these false uh, assumptions that are being made. So Prabhupada explains this in depth, and he says, anything transcendental to material nature is inconceivable and thus cannot be grasped through mundane arguments. And then he writes, without the mercy of the Supreme Lord, such esoteric subjects are incomprehensible even if one spends many years researching them. Beyond the sensual realm lie indirect, subtle perceptions which need to be properly understood. But they can be understood properly only if one sees their relationship to the inconceivable transcendental absolute truth, meaning Krishna. Without seeing this connection, one will find all discussion of these subtle perceptions to be like beating the chafe for grain. So in other words, chafe means the outer skin of the rice. So when you, uh, when in India they have this uh, uh, straw type of basket, you know, and, and they get the grains and they dry them the grains of rice or wheat, they dry them, and then they throw them up and down, up and down, up and down, until the chafe comes off. They do that in Africa also? Yeah. yeah. Until the chafe, that skin comes off, and then they have, you know, uh, what you would call refined rice, right? Uh, the white rice. But actually, you get a natural rice. It's not white. It has that skin on it, you know? But that skin is actually very beneficial for... Uh, uh, a human being, but it's a little rough, so it's it's not as refined as as white rice. So, beating uh, when you beat the chafe, in other words, 
you can beat the chafe all you want. You're not going to get any rice out of it. The rice has already been taken out before. So then Prabhupada says, a mere exercise, this is a mere exercise in futility that brings only frustration and distress. So in other words, if people try to understand transcendental concepts, which oftentimes are very subtle and almost inconceivable for, to gross people, Right, who are engaged in sinful activity, if they try to understand these subtle concepts without reference to Krishna, then it's like beating the chafe. You will not get any rice out of it. You will not get any truth out of it. It will just get speculations, which will lead to frustration and distress. Such em empty sophistry. Sophistry means false logic. People are using false logic making things up. Such empty sophistry may show off some mundane erudition. In other words, the people using big language and coming up with speculative theories that, that, that might show off to others how they're so intelligent, right? But it's actually, but it cannot help one make spiritual progress. In fact, these dry empirical debates often create big hurdles. So it is better to avoid them. Now, one example of this in ISKCON is uh, the Ritvik movement. It's, uh, they're not really in ISKCON. They, they, they've left the movement and made up a whole philosophy that is wrong based on speculation and based on this type of what's called uh, speculation and concocted logic. So they claim that there are no gurus after Srila Prabhupada and uh, that uh, Srila Prabhupada did not appoint any gurus and that the only guru is Prabhupada. So basically what are they doing? They're trying to make Prabhupada into Jesus Christ being daily crucified on the cross by accepting the sins of people uh, let's say it's called posthumous in, uh, uh, in initiation. In other words, when a guru initiates a disciple, he accepts a big responsibility, that is uh, the latent sins of the disciple and has to purify them. <clears throat> so they are throwing all the sins on Prabhupada by saying he's the only guru but see, Prabhupada, and there's proof of this. I, I, I wrote a paper about this. It's, there's proof that sometimes Prabhupada did not accept everyone recommended to him by his disciples. Because the guru has to examine the disciple. Now, the Ritvik people say, well, no, I mean, he, he trusted the temple presidents, and whenever they recommended someone, he accepted them. And that's not true. I, I know uh, there are examples of... Prabhupada did not accept everyone recommended by a temple president. And because the guru is supposed to examine the disciple and the disciple is supposed to examine the guru uh, for a period of time until they're both convinced that uh, the guru is convinced the disciple is qualified for initiation and the disciple is convinced that the guru is bona fide. So the Ritvig philosophy says that uh, no, 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 nobody is qualified. Like no one is an Uttama Adhikari like Srila Prabhupada. Therefore, he is the only guru. And then, and then they use sophistry and word jugglery and false logic to try and prove that Prabhupada never appointed anyone to become guru after him. Now, Prabhupada addresses this point also that he gives the example of the post peon. In fact, he compared himself to a post peon. What is a post peon? That means uh, he is working for the postal, you know, United States Postal Service, let's say, or Indian Postal Service. And, and peon means that he's, uh, he's just an ordinary worker. He's not some big intellectual or a big rich guy or something, right? But he gets a money order, let's say, for $1,000, and he delivers it to a person, 
and he gives it to that person. Now, even though he's a post peon, he's not a rich guy, he might not even be a big intelligent guy, right? But yet, he delivers the goods. He was given $1,000 to deliver it to some person, and it's, it's a postal uh, uh, transfer of money, and he actually delivers the goods, just like he delivers letters, and now he's delivering this letter with a, uh, a check in it. So Prabhupada says he compares himself to a post peon. He's received knowledge from his bona fide guru, and he's simply repeating what his guru said. And he says often that my only qualification is that I never deviated from my guru's instructions, and I have not changed one word of his instructions. I'm simply delivering it. So he's, he gives this example to, to prove that his disciples, who are sincere followers, who actually follow the rules and regulations and do not deviate, do not speculate, and do not have uh, this false pride, uh, they are actually bona fide gurus, although they may not be uttama adhikaris in the sense of Srila Prabhupada. But because they're honest and they're delivering the same message without any adulteration, then they are guru. And in that case, anyone can be a guru. Anyone who correctly transmits the, the knowledge of Krishna without changing it or adulterating it, they're acting like a guru. So therefore, there are shiksha and diksha gurus. Shiksha gurus are ones who instruct people without changing anything in the message. Exactly what Prabhupada says, exactly what Krishna says, that's what they say also. So when you engage in that type of unadulterated transmission of Vedic knowledge, and of course you yourself have to follow that, that, those instructions, then you're acting like a guru. So therefore there's shiksha gurus, there's diksha gurus. There, there's different, and, and they can both give what's called divya gyan, transcendental knowledge, as long as they don't adulterate anything. But yet the unqualified sons of brahmanas they're adulterating the message. They're making up things that are not true based on sophistry or false logic and speculation. So Prabhupada says, it is strongly recommended that one simply follow in the footsteps of spiritual stalwarts. That means those who are strictly following Krishna consciousness. Right? And that is basically a, a uh, alternate translation of the, the verse uh, that says that uh, Mahajana Yenikata Sapanta is part of a bigger verse that says Tarko Patista Shrutayo Vibhina that uh, you, cannot, you, you cannot understand spiritual life by logic and argument. Now, that's what the Ritviks use, logic and argument. It's actually false logic. And you cannot understand uh, the spiritual knowledge simply by listening to one lecture or another lecture or one pundit and another pundit because sometimes the pundits don't agree, right? And he also says you cannot understand simply by reading. Okay, then how can you understand? Mahajana yenikata sapanta. You have to follow the instructions of a pure devotee because this transcendental knowledge is hidden in the heart of the devotee. Therefore, you can only tell by the actions of a pure devotee, just like the actions of Lord Chaitanya. What did he do? He chanted Hare Krishna. He didn't chant it, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. He chanted Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So we have to follow Lord Chaitanya. He is a Mahajan. He is a perfect... Uh, follower of the Vedic Dharma and his message is exactly the same as Krishna. Of course, he is Krishna himself but to prove it, he repeated. So Krishna says Sarvadharma Prityaja and Lord Chaitanya says chant Hare Krishna and take prasadam, worship the deity, associate with genuine devotees and uh, engage in devotional service. So it's the same message right? without any adulteration. So here it says that uh, 
one should not raise too many doubts and questions. As the Lord states in the Bhagavad Gita 4.34, tat vidi paripatena paripasthena sevaya. Just try to learn the truth by approaching a spiritual master. Inquire from him submissively and render service unto him. This process, which strictly follows the Vedas, will bring us to a realization of the inconceivable truth. Once we are in this, on this path, many realizations dawn on us. Usually dawn is when the sun comes up. So many realizations will appear in our minds, just like the sun coming up, will dawn on us. And it is imperative that we pursue them in order to progress further. Well, yeah, let's say you have a realization, but because a disciple always double checks his thoughts with the spiritual master and masters, six and Diksha gurus, to make sure they had not imagining something or speculating something, right? So that, that's where he says that, and it is imperative that we pursue them. That's these realizations that we get in order to progress further. The faint illumination of knowledge that appears at first is certain to lead to full enlightenment, but we have to be patient. So I remember uh, when I uh, was talking to one devotee who helped me uh, become convinced about Krishna consciousness, and he said that in Krishna consciousness, it's, it's somewhat different than Christianity, Christianity accepts God as the order supplier. In other words, dear God, give us this day our daily bread. We're asking for <coughs> food from God. He said, but in Krishna consciousness, we, and that's accepting God as like our Father. Our Father, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, uh, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So this is the this is the prayer that the Christians say every day. And at the end they say, give us this day our daily bread, right? However, the devotees don't consider Krishna their father. They consider Krishna their son. And therefore, instead of asking for something from Krishna, they supply what Krishna likes. Now, when he told me that, this is like, you know, over 50 years ago. I was amazed by that statement. I had never heard that before, that considering God your son rather than your father. Because from the father, you're waiting for something to, for him to give. But if, if you're the father and he's the son, you have to give. You, you can't ask your son, you know, oh, oh, go out and work and give me some food. You, know? <laughs> you have to give your son or your child uh, food. So, but it's taken many, many years for me although I was impressed right away, and it was one of the statements that inspired me to become a devotee, but yet to realize what that means takes a long, long time. It does, it's not like immediately you understand. Immediately you, 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 you're shocked. You never heard that before, and it's, and, and it's appealing. But to understand it in depth is another thing. So that's why Prabhupada says, the faint illumination of knowledge that appears at first is certain to lead to full enlightenment, but we have to be patient. What, is, what does it mean we have to be patient? We have to come regularly every day to the temple for Mangalarti and for class and for Tulsi Puja and all these things. You, know, you have to be patient. It, take, it could take a long time to fully, uh, to, to have full enlightenment. We must carefully avoid letting pride enter our hearts because of some initial perceptions of the inconceivable, right? So one time, I've told this story before, there's, I was driving with this new uh, newcomer to Krishna consciousness who was coming to the temple and listening to classes. And he was telling me, uh, you know, about uh, how I, th I asked him, I said, uh, do you have a guru? And he, he said, yes. I said, oh, okay. I said, are, you, are you initiated? This is when he, when he first came, and he was driving me somewhere. He said, yeah, my guru is Cheta Guru. I said, Cheta Guru? He said, yeah. I said, uh, 
And what, do you get instructions from your guru? Oh, he said, all the time. I said, is he telling you to do anything right now? So he was driving, and for a second he goes like this. Yeah, he just told me to turn right, and he turned the car right. <laughs> <laughs> You see how stupid people are. I mean, it's unbelievable, right? So, uh, you know, I mean, obviously, he didn't last long in the temple. <laughs> you know, he had, he had, because he was proud. And this is what Prabhupada is saying here. He's proud, you know. He heard some little thing in a class about Chaita Guru, Krishna inside the heart. You know, and it's true. It's not false. But he missed the other point. The other point is given in Bhagavad Gita and uh, verse uh, 18, chapter 58, where uh, Prabhupada explains fifty-eight, fifty-nine. It says, no conditioned soul actually knows what is to be done as what is, and what is not to be done. But a person who acts in Krishna consciousness is free to act because everything is prompted by Krishna from within and confirmed by the spiritual master, implying without. But more, most specifically in Srimad Bhagavatam 1.7.5, Prabhupada makes it even clearer. He says, within the super soul becomes spiritual master and without he becomes spiritual master as scriptures, saints, and initiator spiritual master. Sadhushasa Guru. Huh? Sadhushasa Guru. Right? Yes, yes. Keep scriptures, saints, and initiator guru. Right? Okay, so, yes, there's guru within and there's guru without. And you have to, if you th get some in instruction from the guru within or chaita guru, according to this statement, and, and, and he doesn't make that statement once. He makes it many times in other places. He says it has to be confirmed by the guru without, or, or the, in, the scriptures, saints, and initiator guru. So that's, you know, that's the logic of the half hen. Uh, it, the, the person that says, oh, I only take instructions to say to guru. Well, that's half the hen. That means you won't get the egg because you cut the hen in half. And so you can't expect to get any egg from that hen. <clears throat> okay, so then uh, he, he, Prabhupada continues, and we'll stop in a second. He says, <clears throat> he says, we must carefully avoid letting pride enter our hearts because of some initial perceptions of the inconceivable absolute. Rather, we must eagerly, re eagerly approach the guru or the pure devotee and ask how to proceed. We must reject the narrow and bigoted idea that there is nothing more to know. The most important point is to always fully depend on the mercy of the supreme spiritual master residing in the heart, that is, Paramatma or Krishna. Okay, so uh, we see that havoc has been done on the uh, on Hinduism, so-called Hinduism, by the Dvijabandhus. And Prabhupada, in a previous statement, says that this happened about 100 years ago. Well, that was in the 1950s, so in the 1850s. Well, what's, what's so important about the 1850s? It's that from 1825 onward, the British took over the educational system in India. And the first generation that was educated during, according to the British system and not the traditional system that was in India, they became mature in 25 years. And they, Prabhupada says, changed the philosophy. These unqualified sons of brahmanas educated by the British, they changed the philosophy and they said, <clears throat> you have to be born in a Brahmana family in order to be a Brahmana. And it's impossible for a Sudra to become a Brahmana in this lifetime, okay? So, 
That is the sad state of affairs today. And it's still going on, and it's still causing havoc in Hinduism. Okay, we'll stop right there. Are there any questions? Um, is this Yes. Yeah. It's just uh, as we discussed today, pride is uh, it is said to be greatest enemy of living entity. And he said that Krishna is very very concerned about his devotees being proud, hmm. and Krishna's business is he will trashes the pride of his devotees, beginning from the gopis, Arjuna, Uddhava, all of them, they've been crushed. The pride by Krishna. Example of, of, of Uddhava, his pride was crushed by Krishna when Krishna sent him to Vrindavan. Because Uddhava was thinking he's a great devotee, very intimate, you know, because Krishna said, Natatame, Natatame was a verse, Natatame Brahma Junid, Na Sankarshana, Na Sasankarshana, Na Lakshmi. Basically, he said that, Uddhava, you're very dear to me, more than myself my wife, Brahma, Shiva. So Uddhava was very, pr very proud. And then Krishna sent to Vrindavan to see how actually right. <laughs> we were devotees when he saw that. And then Arjuna also, Krishna did that. After the battlefield of Kurukshetra, Arjuna was very internally, it was not like gross way, but in a subtle way, Arjuna was very proud. He's thinking now I've received knowledge directly from the Supreme Lord. <laughs> And then once they, he's moving in the chariot, you know, like two friends moving in the, in the banks of Jamuna, having some, you know, fresh air. <laughs> <laughs> so Krishna knew that Arjuna was proud. And then Krishna manifests this pastime. They saw Jambuka. Jambuka is Jaco, right? Yeah? Okay. So this Jaco was circumambulating a dead body. Somebody was dead, and then it's accumulating. And then as soon as, Chris, as Juna saw that, he said, hey, this jackal is very stupid. <laughs> this dead body is food, and then he's accumulating, not eating it. So when a big animal, you know, yeah. comes there, you know, chase him away. And then he will miss his, 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 yeah, his food. So Krishna, understood that and then they stopped and then Krishna uh, called Jambuka that that uh, Jaku come here and then Jaku went there to Krishna and paid obeisances <laughs> paid obeisance to Krishna and Krishna said okay why are you not eating this dead body you know you're just moving around when the big animal comes here and you, you you'll be chased away so Jambuka said, oh my Lord, I am foolish animal, very low. But um, since you ask me, you my Lord, I will give the answer. <laughs> and then this Jambuka said, I'm circumambulating, smelling different parts of the body with this human being. Just to make sure, it's, if it's not prashad, I won't take it. <laughs> I won't eat impure dead body. So how will this be prashad? By smelling the legs, I know, okay, this person has gone to uh, pilgrimage to, to visit the holy places. By smelling the hands, I know this person have, has offered obeisances to the devotees, <laughs> to the Supreme Lord in the temple. By smelling his head, I know he has bowed down his head to the devotees. <laughs> So any part of the body is rendered some service, then I'll eat that part. <laughs> if it, that, any part of the body which hasn't been engaged in service, I won't eat it. That's impure. Hmm. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> and, then, uh, and then Krishna said, Jamuka, I'm very, very pleased with you. You're my devotee. You, you have a knowledge. You have true knowledge. <laughs> so this Arjuna becomes speechless, you know, because he was thinking the, 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 the jackal was stupid and he was intelligent. So in this way, uh, the pride of Arjuna was, you know, leveled. 
And uh, so we're talking about the pride, you know, pride is very, very. Oh, wait, where is that story from? Um, I heard it from, from, I think from Upanishads. I don't know exactly which Upanishad is. It? Okay. I have <laughs> good at telling that story. So. Yeah. So uh, pride is, is demonia. And it's in Kali Yuga, the, uh, the, uh, the pride is, oh, pride is measuring vote. So one is pride, I'm greater than the other. That's the mentality of people of Kali Yuga. They're always proud, you know, thinking that, you know, I'm better than the other. So this example, or do you bandu like that, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. I just want to confirm with you. <laughs> Haribo. Any other questions? Yeah. Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj. Yes. So, Maharaj is pride, even though in within devotees, if the pride, even though very senior devotees having pride, so is the main cause material desires or material motive? Or there are many layers. Pride is, uh, false pride is based on ignorance. If you become proud, you think that you are qualified in some way, but actually you're not qualified, you see. But it's because of that ignorance that you think you're qualified. And you attempt to, to uh, act as a uh, professor or a, 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 uh, an expert in something. But actually you don't, you don't really know that thing properly. See? So the opposite of pride is humility. Okay. Right? So therefore Bhaktivinoda Thakur said that we should uh, keep a garland of this mantra Trinada Pisunichina Twadara Pisistana Mani Namana Dina Kirtaniya Sadahari and it wants to be more tolerant than a tree, more humble than the grass in the street, and not, which should be ready to offer all respect to others, so even those who don't respect you. Right? So that type of humility is absolutely necessary to remain a devotee. But if we become proud because we have some realization, uh, and we think that you know we're the only one that ever had that realization, we're special, other people are not as great as I am, whatever. You know, so that, that type of pride, and, and even the pauper is proud of his penny, right? So, you know, it doesn't mean that only rich people or highly intelligent people become proud. You know, anybody can become proud, you know. You can see horses that are proud and dogs that are proud, you know. They think they have something over all the other horses or dogs. So the humility is, is the sign of a genuine devotee. And, then, and we're hearing about that, how humble Parikshit Maharaj is, how humble Yudhisthira Maharaj is, and so forth. Because of humility, you can be instructed. Because of pride, you can refuse instruction. It's due to ignorance. So someone can say, well, shouldn't I be proud that uh, uh, I took initiation from Prabhupada? No, you should be thankful, not, not proud in the sense of, uh, oh, I'm better than everybody else because they didn't take initiation from Prabhupada. No, you should be thankful you, you did that. A, there's a difference between being thankful and being proud. Right? So the devotee is always thankful and, uh, and does not assume a false position uh, due to ignorance and and development of pride. Thank you, Maharaj. Yeah. And, and one more aspect, Maharaj, if someone is doing some specific service, even though it's a devotional service, and uh, because they did it, and like most of the other people were not able to do it, so that can also cause uh, pride, uh, even though they are rendering the devotional service. That's another... Uh, well, again, that's due to ignorance. ignorance yeah. Right? Who, who gave that intelligence or that power to the devotee to do something that other people can't do? They think they did it themselves. They think they are the yeah. doer. Yeah. But actually, uh, 
Krishna gave them that ability. Just like the eagle can fly through the air. Right? We can't fly through the air, right? Like the eagle. Uh, but uh, the human being uh, can do certain things that other human beings can't do because of some potency that they have. But where do they get the potency from? And by the way, it can be taken back. True. You can see uh, that a person can be in the prime of their life and they make some stupid mistake, they have an accident, and they're paralyzed the rest of their life. It, it was taken back. Or someone is, uh, uh, can speak very eloquently and then they get cancer of the throat and then they have to take out the, uh, the larynx and they can't speak anymore. They're going to be paralyzed. They're going to be paralyzed, yeah. So Krishna gives us certain powers, but it's not, we, should, we should use them only in his service, not become proud and start exploiting others with that uh, particular power that we get. If we exploit others, then it's going to be taken back. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay, we'll stop right there. Thank you very much. All glories to Srila Prabhupada.